The United States, they claim, was uh, holding uh, uh, secretly in various prisons around the world. I know we have a debate, like uh, the CIA says, well, we're following U.S. law, and besides, they've been released, and so on and so forth. I mean, what are we talking about? How can, you know, suppose that Iran says, oh, we picked up 39 Americans, we're hiding them somewhere. I mean, do we then have a debate about whether it follows Iranian law? I mean, you know, the, the discussions that go on are lunatic, almost without exception, unless you accept the fundamental imperial premise. You know, we own the world, so anything we do is okay. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, keep more or less to the letter of what we say is the law, but it can't be wrong. So, yeah, I agree with you. It's unacceptable, and there are much worse things that are much more unacceptable, and we should be doing something about it. How do you remain sane? <laughs> How do you retain some kind of emotional balance, if, if you do, when you talk about these terrible things? I mean, I have problems. What do you do? <laughs> Actually, there, there are very good reasons to remain sane. There's been a lot of progress. I mean, it's worth looking at how different the world was not many years ago. Okay, that makes a difference, and it's a reason for hope. So yeah, there are hideous things going on, there always have been, you know, going on now. But we can do something about them, and the people are ready for it. Just have to be willing to step up and do something like they've done in the past often, and are doing right now. I mean, if you couldn't do anything at all, it would be hard to remain sane about it. But you can do a lot. And that doesn't do any good to agonize about it. You're not helping anybody. You know, like if your civil rights work, okay, that's doing something about it. If you just sat alone and said, I'm not going to do anything, I'm going to agonize at home, you're not helping anybody. Just kind of on that note, you're talking about how like we've come so far. We, there's been a lot of changes, which I completely acknowledge and we tend to forget. But it's I, I and I almost feel like the stranglehold of corporations embedded in the government is worse than it was, causing a whole another battle for us to try to break through, even though there has been great strides taken. See, I, I think your perception is understandable. But it's understandable because uh, not long ago nobody even raised the question of corporate control of the government. It's taken for granted. And now it's a question. So we perceive it. And in fact, there are anti-corporate movements for the first time. I mean, not the first time. You know, like you go back in American labor history, the you know, the strong strain of American labor history is that uh, people who work in the mills hold on them. You know, that there should be worker self-management, there shouldn't be any, and corporations were bitterly condemned when they were created by the state about a century ago. And they were condemned by conservatives, literally, who regarded them as a return to feudalism and a form of communism, which is not on, inaccurate. They were, in fact, a return to feudal guilt, uh, and they were bitterly attacked. Uh, but for a long time, that hasn't happened. They were supported by progressives, incidentally. We thought it's a good idea, you know, you have big corporate entities, kind of like uh, Leninist doctrine and so on. Uh, but uh, and now there are anti-corporate movements. And in fact, you know, there are, uh, there are calls for uh, states to uh, withdraw corporate charters. In fact, some of them have come remarkably close to success. It surprised me. There's one case in California that the Center for Constitutional Rights was working on, actually my sister-in-law was working on it, so it kept me up to date. Uh, they uh, were calling on the Attorney General of California to uh, uh, remove the corporate charter of Unical for crimes it committed in California and in Burma. Slave labor in Burma and uh, you know, pollution, environmental destruction in California. I mean, nobody thought that. So the Attorney General not only has the right to do that, he has legal obligation to do it. Okay, and nobody thought that case was going to get anywhere. It got through the courts, got through the appeals court. Uh, it was a strong enough case so that the corporation settled out of court because they were afraid to let it go to the next level. Well, when you settle out of court, it's a secret agreement, so we don't know exactly what they settled for, but you know a lot about it, included a lot of companies.
compensation to Burmese slave laborers. Uh, okay, that's getting pretty close. Uh, you're calling on the state attorney general to perform his legal duty to uh, eliminate the corporate charter of a criminal organization. And things like that are happening elsewhere. There are parts of, you know, right-wing rural Pennsylvania where they ban corporations. In fact, there are national, they're small, you know, but there are national movements now, which is new. So your perception is correct. We now perceive that problem, and that's the step towards doing something about it. Talk about uh, deep integration with Canada and the use of the FTA or FTAA to eliminate uh, the Canadian social programs and take control of natural resources, especially uh, oil and water. Yeah. Well, a large part of the point of these mislabeled free trade agreements, they're not free trade agreements, but we're called free trade agreements, uh, is to simply, uh, in the case of Canada, uh, to provide U.S. corporations with uh, access to Canadian resources. Now, there's no objection to this on the part of the U.S., the Canadian corporate elite, because they have the same interest. I mean, they don't care very much, you know, so they'll, you know, shift around the board of directors and still make the same profits. It makes a difference to Canadians, because the one goal of it would be to eliminate Canadian social systems, which is happening already. Uh, anybody who's Canadian can spell out the details. So part of the, uh, the goal of the agreements is already being achieved. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting to look into the details of these agreements. There's obviously a tremendous disparity of force between Canada and the United States. Well, you know, it has happened that... Uh, uh, there, Canada has brought uh, disputes to the, uh, uh, the agreement system has an adjudicating board and Canada has brought complaints against the United States and Canada won and the United States told them to get lost. You know, yeah, of course, that's what an agreement is. I mean, the, the Canadians uh, made some noises about it. I think the Canadian Minister of Interior said, okay, if you're not going to live up to the agreement, we're going to start exporting our oil to China. Yeah, oh, yeah. just try it. <laughs> Tomorrow there won't be any Canada. If you want to pursue it, there, there's some interesting studies of the effect of, especially NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, Again, the words are ridiculous, but let's keep them. Uh, the effects on working people in all three countries. Uh, there was a study that came out about a year ago by the Economic Policy Institute, one of the main economic analysis institutes. Uh, uh, and it turns out that this is one of those remarkable agreements which harmed working people in all three countries. Uh, in Canada, the United States, and in Mexico. Of course, it harmed the most in Mexico because it's the weakest country. But in Canada, too. So it's reaching its goals and also uh, undermining Canadian social programs, which is happening before our eyes. Uh, and much worse in Mexico. Actually, why, are, you know, why is there a discussion about an immigration bill? Uh, why, why are people fleeing from Mexico to the United States, not from the United States to Mexico? Uh, why are they fleeing from North Africa to Europe instead of the other way around? I mean, you know. We know why. Uh, part of the, the whole history of imperialism is the reason why. And NAFTA is having the predictable effects. I mean, to take a narrower point, if, if you follow Mexico, you actually, if, if you go to a supermarket in the United States, you'll notice the prices of commodities are going up, you know, bread, meat, and so on. If you go to Mexico, they're going up even higher. Uh, tortillas, for example, which is the staple for poor Mexicans, are unaffordable now for many Mexicans. There were tortilla riots in Mexico a while ago. Uh, why is this happening? Well, one of the narrow reason is the ethanol craze. Uh, ethanol, which is, you can't produce ethanol in the United States except by massive state intervention. There's a huge subsidy to the corn growers, and you have to have very high tariffs to keep out cheaper Brazilian ethanol, cheaper and more efficient. So in order to develop an ethanol uh, industry in the United States, you have to do what was done all through economic history, have massive state intervention, and you can develop an industry. But if corn, agricultural, you know, agribusiness is 